Hello, listeners. We're so glad to be back with you. What was that? It's a happy thing. Podcasting is a happy thing. If you like our podcast, and if you don't, I'm not sure why you're listening. Maybe you just are hate listening. But if you're not hate listening and you love fundraising heyday, then you're really going to love heyday services. Amanda and I teamed up because we love working together with the podcast so much. We teamed up to uh, form our own training company. We deliver tailored content to educate, coach, and train organizations from large human services organizations to associations with partners or members to many member to grant teams. Um, anyone who is serving maybe local government or the community through their kind of work and wants to provide some really great training to their members so that we can build capacity to do more good things. We are booking out 2024 and 2025 now. If your agency is in need of grant writing prospect research, grant management training, or an overview of all things grants, or a deep dive into something specific, like building a sustainability plan or building a case for support, we are the duo for you. We'd love to talk to you, so reach out to us. Best way is through our email at hello at heydayservices.com. That's H-A-Y-D-A-Y services. Com. Yep. We'd love to bring the education and humor of uh, fundraising heyday directly to your office. So give us a shout. It's not going to be boring, y'all. Not, not at all. So um, one of the things I've learned, um, especially if you're new to grant writing, it can be very easy to be so focused on the writing that you forget about, oh yeah, when we get the grant, there's all this stuff we have to do because we promised we'd do it, right? So, but lucky for us, we have two grant management experts with us today. We are talking to Rachel Werner and Lucy Morgan. Rachel is a project management professional or PMP and also a grant professional certified. So she has her GPC. She leads the RBW strategy team where she and her team have managed over 2.5 billion with a B dollars in grant funding. Okay. So she's, she does her way around grant management. I'd say Lucy Morgan is a certified public accountant or CPA. And she was a um, corporate controller of a nonprofit where she um, worked with this nonprofit that received $190 million in federal grants and then had to help with the management of that. She's also the owner of myfedtrainer.com. Together, these two lead federal grant management boot camps. So to say they know a thing or two is putting it mildly. We recorded this amazing interview live at the 2023 Grant Summit, which is powered by the Grant Professionals Association. We were in a bustling exhibit hall. Um, So there's going to be some background noise. But I will say, if you're only listening to this podcast rather than watching it on YouTube, you might want to transfer over to get the real full experience because Lucy and Rachel are the queen of props and they showed up, y'all. They showed up to that exhibit hall. So either way, listening or watching, y'all enjoy. Hey there. We are thrilled at the Fundraising Hey Day podcast to bring in Kim Joyce and Associates as a sponsor. This incredible grant consulting firm based in Arizona has worked with nonprofits, for-profits, agencies of all sizes, from tribal governments to hospitals, universities, and everything in between. CEO Kim Joyce is here to share some really interesting tips and tricks that she's learned in her lived experience in this incredibly successful firm. We're so glad you could join us. Kim, one of your clients stated that you are a valued and critical member of their team, helping them double grant revenue in two years. How do you best work with clients to be a team member working hand in hand with them rather than a consultant who shows up and magically just makes all the work happen? Well, that word team definitely describes what the whole process is about. So we explained our clients up front that it's a collaborative relationship and there's a lot of hard work that goes into it on both parts. It's time consuming on everyone. We let our clients know that we can write the best grants possible, but they have to be able to carry out the project. So they have to have ownership in that and that takes time. 
we establish expectations up front with our first client launch call and then throughout the client relationship so that we're letting them know what's going on and engaging them in everything that's going on. We have regular communication. We do what we say we're going to do. And we let our clients know we're the experts in the field and we can help guide them through the grants process. Um, we also tie, uh, track our time uh, for all of the activities that we do with clients so that we, we know how much time things take and we can inform them, hey, it's going to take this long to get onboarded. It's going to take this many months to do these items. So they have as much information as possible up front and they know what the relationship is going to look like. To find out more about the incredible team at Kim Joyce and Associates, visit KimJoyceAssociates.com. If you want to join a consulting firm who places value on integrity, excellence, and community, check out the Career Opportunities page. Kim is always on the lookout for her next great hire, as well as her next great client. So... Take it away, Kim. Okay, I'm going to think of myself as Elton John here right now. Yes. You could think of yourself as Because he had like. glasses. I like, remember when a rock was gone. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's fun. Yeah. I was thinking Tony Dancer, actually. Hold me closer, <laughs> Tony Danza. <laughs> Wait, is that not yeah, the word? Tony Danza. <laughs> Tony Danza. Yes. Just kidding. Just kidding. Oh, it's a family pod. <laughs> <laughs> So welcome to the Grant Summit Karaoke Corner, where we've been having lots of fun. <laughs> yes, yes, Back we have. here with our wonderful guests, Rachel Werner and Lucy Morgan, special PSA. We're recording this during um, a time at the 2023 Grant Summit when vendors are leaving, people are coming by, there will be sounds of tables and plates, and it's all okay. We're okay. We're here. And we're having a lovely time. Absolutely. So I just wanted y'all to know that. Yes. Yes. Um, so we have two wonderful experts here, and we're going to take turns asking questions, yep. and um, I guess it's age before beauty, so I, have, I get to, to ask the first one. So this is for Rachel. So Rachel, um, by the time this goes out, you will have taught mm -hmm. a grant, shop, grant Summit workshop about the common challenges and pitfalls around grants management. And so I, we won't be stealing your thunder if I ask you to please reveal maybe the top three ways it can just go wrong. Yeah. So, <laughs> All yeah. the ways. Yeah. So, All I mean, the thing is, so many ways. the top three, that's just like, you know, the, the, trying to go to a French bakery and just picking the, the top three uh, items that you can consume. You know? I know. It, I'm, I'm cruel that way. Yeah. <laughs> so Forcing I, you to choose. And, and I think you just have to bucket them because I think that there are okay, common buckets, buckets okay. that you could have other issues fall under. I think one of the biggest is segregation of duties because I have a nice. lot of situations where it's, this is not my job. I don't think that I need to do this. And it's your issue, not mine. Even though a lot of people are involved in the administration of award, we know it's a team sport. Mm. I'm not speaking about anything new here. I think that what people don't understand is that there's so many components to administering a grant that people really don't understand that you can't just look at it as a top level, that's financial management. But within that, there's all these little subtasks and all these important components. One other key point right. is a segregation of duties. So who's going to be overseeing and authorizing certain actions? So I'd say that's one, communication. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, <laughs> preach. Okay. So, I mean, how often do you have a someone from finance, someone from program coming together and a beautiful story emerges, right? It's like, it's, it's like a, a you know, it's it, the birds are chirping, <laughs> the squirrels are is being sung. frolicking and no, all the we, time. So what usually happens in, in the situations that I see is someone from the program side say, I didn't say that I was going to do that. How come I'm signed up to do this? We can't measure that. What is this budget? Wait a second. <laughs> there, those things don't happen pre-award. So what mm -hmm. happens that it trickles down yep. and then people end up in situations where, guess what? 
everyone gets egg on their faces, and then you're trying to course correct for a situation that could have been handled in the beginning right. with a kickoff call or even just an email communication. Why don't we talk about that budget? Why don't we talk about how you would actually want to spend these funds instead of the finance person making decisions and assumptions yeah. that including. So I think so communication true. is critical. And also when you bring in other partners, forget about it. You know, when you've got like external partners who are not brought in and sub-recipients, that is also critical as well. Because then what happens is that it becomes a partnership in grant name only and not a true partnership because they're not really clarifying how everyone is supposed to work together in that, again, harmonious, happy time. And then the last thing I will say is record keeping, because that Ooh, is yeah. huge, huge, huge. And again, all those kind of relate because it's about the way that the organizational systems are set up and having people understand why that culture of compliance is critical. But we know what happens if you don't have information for the auditors don't have information for the feds, then it all just is, wait, where is this house? Especially with all these hybrid working situations, then where are you storing it? It's not going to be in that metal file cabinet. It's going to be, <laughs> it could be. My, my three ring binders had to go away when I started working from home. So yeah. I had no room at the end. So I, yeah, electronic was my new best friend. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to be UPSing no. like all of these different binders. So no. then where's the information house? Right. Is it mm -hmm. going to be Google Teams, VPN? How are you doing that? So I think that an understanding what records to keep, who should be keeping the records, and that yes. is very important. So because then if you have an audit, it's not just wait a second. What happened to that report? What happened to that procurement checklist that we were supposed to save? So those are my three areas. I'm feeling the three bucket. Um, <laughs> way to uh, describe things so and yeah. we'll yeah. circle back in a minute and maybe you can add in some others that we didn't get to a little bit later <laughs> oh some more buckets oh yeah could be yeah. could be a multi-bucket <laughs> conversation so yes. thank you for that yes well and before we move on i just have to say that federal grant management is one of those things that most people when you start talking about it their eyes just kind of glaze over mm -hmm. because it's just it can be overwhelming it can be very boring i mean hey I, I do it and even i'm like it can be boring but shout out to the <laughs> unicorn ladies who make it fabulous so if you're watching us on youtube lucy and rachel are very well accessorized and i fully embrace and appreciate the uh all the things to make federal grant management and thrilling. Also the giant inflatable unicorn that yes. was gracing the exhibit. If you hall. were at Grant Summit and were anywhere near the exhibitors hall, you what did y'all name him? Eunice. 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 Her, her excuse her, me, yes. yes. Eunice the unicorn is amazing. So I, I appreciate I appreciate the props. Lucy, you are fab at the props. <laughs> I fully hey, embrace hey, we it. We were the fun booth at GPA yes. Grant Summit. Absolutely. So. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, well, let's go from fun unicorn discussions to uniform guidance regulations. <laughs> and Paul descended. Guidance. <laughs> that was, that was a unicorn segue. guidance, oh, but the uniform guidance. Unicorn right. guidance. <laughs> um, and what I want to talk about is I feel like for years we had the same guidelines. It was almost as if nothing changed. And then 2015, we got all kinds of fabulous and needed changes. Right. But they didn't just sit there. I feel like constantly there's a new memo, there's a new update, there's a new thing. And it can be very scary to think, oh my gosh, what did I miss? What am I forgetting? So you have any advice for people? What's the best way to keep up with all this stuff to make sure you're doing the documentation right and you are doing the segregation of duties right, that nothing has changed? Because it has changed. Yeah, I think that's a great question because I think everyone should sit down and read the whole 473 pages mm. of the proposed changes to the uniform guidance which uh, the Office of Management and Budget put out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, which within, I think, about two minutes, I started getting emails saying, can you summarize that for us? Like, yeah, you yeah, did. I can't summarize 473 <laughs> pages in two minutes. <laughs> but I think very quickly people need to distinguish the difference between worrying about your hair being on fire and it actually being on fire. Yeah. Right. So we have 473 pages of worrying about our hair being on fire but our hair is not really on fire mm -hmm. right this is more of a this is what we're thinking might happen we're considering this what do you think do you want to give us some comments okay. and none of these things have actually happened yet 
So while it's good to have an appreciation of what are the risks and the changes for your organization, I want everybody to take a deep breath. This is, you know, this we can predict every five years OMB is going to do some changes and then there'll be some interim changes and executive orders and all these things. That's just part of life, right? We're yeah. not in a things never change. Um, not Which just is good. related to the unicorn guidance or the unicorn <laughs> guidance. It's fair. Things, things are, it's, change is a constant. So how do we deal with change? Well, one of the ways we deal with change, because we're all very busy people, is we take advantage of this little thing that um, was invented not that long ago called Google. <laughs> and we search on something like uniform guidance proposed changes. And there's all these wonderful people that put out nice little summaries and articles that we can go to and go, okay, somebody's already cut to the chase. Yes. Along with that, at the beginning of any time they do these proposed changes, they do something called an executive summary. So you don't have to read all 473 pages. You can just go to the executive summary. Now, I have found that the last executive summary that came out was not really very helpful because I wanted someone that was going to say, oh, by the way, the de minimis rate may go up to 15%. The threshold for the single audit threshold or single audit might go up to a million dollars. I mean, I'd like to have like, you know, I like bulleted lists. It'd be nice if they did that. But they didn't do that. They kind of talked about it was more of a kind of a kumbaya executive summary about we're going to reduce your burden. Right? Okay. You feel your burden has been lessened. Um, so I would just use Google and just go start reading some of those wonderful summaries that are put out there by people who have whole staffs that are writing about this all stuff all the time. Um, and then I would just say, just take a breath and recognize, is this something I need to know right now? And sometimes there was that flurry, like everybody went, yeah. oh, it's going to happen before the end of the year. No, it's not going to happen before the end of the year. If you are in an institution or some type of organization that really wants to do some comments, yeah, there's some things you need to comment by a certain date. But for most of us out there in the trenches who are just trying to figure out what does this mean to me and my grants, uh, you'll you'll know you'll know soon enough. So there just kind of take a breath and start, you know, a little bit at a time. See what things might affect you. Yes. So that would be my advice. I like Your it. hair is not really on fire. Yes. Yet. <laughs> As my friend Sylvia likes to say, can we all just calm down? <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's going to be okay. Yep. So speaking of things that people get really excited about, and perhaps as if they're here, we're on fire. Yeah. All the funding that is has come out and will come out from uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or BIL, which I will mm -hmm. say now because easier. Um, I've heard it from clients and potential clients. Uh, we did an Ask Us Anything, and it was like, well, it's all the money. How are we going to get all the money? Here comes all the money. Who's going to get the money? Can we get the money? <laughs> and it was kind of like that. Yes. And so I'm circling back to the, the cruel choices I made you make yeah. earlier. <laughs> and if we were to take you know, the kinds of information that you might give organizations and agencies newer to the federal mm -hmm. grants process who are very excited about BIL and what it could do. I'm also thinking about like some of those smaller cities in Georgia where we've done some work with the Municipal Association where city may just be a, a little town somewhere and they're trying, you know, they want clean water, they want broadband, they want all the things. What are some, I don't want to say pitfalls, but maybe some just some pieces of advice that these newbies should consider mm -hmm. when they're wading into the waters of BIL or other big federal Oh, yes, and that, that's happened a lot over the past right? two or three years, and sometimes these county agencies are just getting the money. You've got to spend it, and then there's no planning. <laughs> uh -huh. There's no, you know, thinking about how, what is the best way to, and they, they have to spend in a short period of right. time, and then that's where problems happen, yes. right? Because you're given all this money, and the way I look at it, there's a couple of things. One, I call compliance the vegetables of the grants world. Oh, nice. So... People love the grant writing because it's like, ooh, that's the dessert, right? Oh, I see. Okay. okay. That's, that's the yummy part. But yeah. then when you get the grant, then you say, oh, here's your broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> and here's, Enjoy. <laughs> here's, here's your spinach. And then they say, oh, oh, I got to eat that too. Because guess what? That's part of the balanced diet. You that's have right. to be able to do that in order to eat the dessert. I mean, that's what I tell my kids, right? Like you have the dessert, but you need to eat your dinner first. And that's yeah. the same thing. And so you really need to understand what you're getting into. People do not read 
the guidance. They do not really understand. And I have this prop that I've used with uh, my fed trainer. I have the little shiny disco ball, which I'm like, ooh, look at the shiny, shiny. object. <laughs> I want that money. That money looks so good. And then you put it down, and then you get a ball of string. And then you say, here's this compliance layer. Here's this one. Here's this one. And that's when you say, is the juice worth the squeeze? And you really need to understand what goes into it. Do you have the resources? Do you have the capacity? So I think before going after any of these mm -hmm. types of grants, um, with the exception of those where it's just handed to you, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, some it's like a state pass through yeah. and it goes out by population yeah. or issue or yeah. yeah. But you need to make sure that you can actually do the work because now that there's so much more increased transparency, there's right. a lot of focus on being accessible to the public, you know, go to USA Spending, can you go look in at all of the funding that's being given yeah. out? You need to be able to be very, very focused and have the ability, and the leadership especially, because there's been a lot of push by a lot of the top folks in whatever agency or organization, they see that shiny object, but not, oh, well, we'll just figure it out. <laughs> this is a not we'll figure it out situation mm. when you're talking about millions of dollars that has to be spent in a in fairly a, short amount of time and in yeah. a very certain way and only yes. on certain things yes yeah. so i would say there's a lot of things that you can do as you're going through the process you can do a risk assessment you can really start to think about the partners and vetting those partners mm -hmm. you can start to put together gosh darn i love a good internal control you know, get the internal controls. You have some of those policies and procedures. Or there's things that you can do, which some of them probably have already, but they haven't thought about it for, through the lens of a federal grant. Mm -hmm. They yeah. probably have a travel policy. There might true. be some procurement policy. We hope. We, yeah, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but then, you know, there are things that you can do to prepare instead of waiting until the award. So yeah. yep. that would be my suggestion. There you go. All those lovely, sexy things, internal mm. controls, oh, internal oh, risk oh, assessments. Yeah. Those are all so the important. vegetables that yes. you know, we love to eat. As a vegetarian. I was going to say, <laughs> you're no, down for it. that. It, to me, I was thinking about, you know, steamed, limp steamed broccoli yes. on a line. Not that that happened here because it didn't. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, the idea of poorly prepared bland vegetables. Yes, like or, like or. cauliflower. You want some steamed cauliflower. You might want you, you break out the air fryer, get yeah. a little seasoning. Yeah, I got exactly. You. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True story. True Thanks story. for that. <laughs> well, sadly, there are a lot of agencies that don't have things like internal controls and risk assessment. So much so that Kimberly and I every year do an episode on the podcast called "Rip from the Headlines," where we talk about all the horrible, naughty things people have done with grant funding whether and do it's take a, a slight pleasure in doing it because some of the stuff is so outrageous yes but yeah. actually it's seriously it's really not yes. though, right because and we're talking mishandling of funds yeah. we're talking broken rules all kinds of things um it does happen though i mean it, ha it happens quite a bit and unfortunately there are some grant professionals will walk into these situations or they've maybe they don't even know that's what they're walking into but they've discovered oh my agency hasn't been doing things correctly mm. And you may have discovered the problem before your funder does. So, Lucy, do you have any suggestions for somebody who's in that new situation? They're realizing, whether it's small or large, what are some steps they can take for fixing that before it comes an even bigger problem? Sure. And, you know, I love that you bring this up because I think two of our most popular podcast episodes on Grant Talks, and yes. one is with you, <laughs> and it talks about the very first day that you walked into a job and oh, the OIG yes. was coming in. Yes. And I think uh, one of the other real popular ones is John or. Rogers, who <laughs> talked about my boss is going to hell or jail. Yes. Right? So it's, it's an issue. It's, we can be real, right? We can yeah. be real. We've all been in, you know, we've yep. been in the trenches seeing these types of things happen. And, uh, you know, I'm, I admitted I'm a grant nerd. I'm also an accountant, so I find uh, accounting fraud and embezzlement to be just a fascinating topic. Like Same. I would go to a cocktail party and, and talk to other people about this topic. Yeah. Um, but it really does come down to this whole concept, uh, like we talked about uh, grant regulations and, you know, when is my hair on fire versus when am I worrying about it? Sometimes you're going to walk into a situation that is salvageable and mm -hmm. people just don't mm -hmm. know. And it's not bad intentions, it's just they don't know. Yeah. So when you come into a situation and you go, ooh, I'm not really sure what's going on here, uh, pretty quickly you need to apply some discernment. 
into right. what you've really walked into. Yeah. And in some cases, it really is that sometimes, as Rachel said, senior leadership is not engaged. They just like the shiny object, and they don't want to hear about any of the right. work that actually right. needs to happen. Right. Yes. That is something, as long as you can get senior leadership on board, that is salvageable. Right? Yeah. So that's something that you can work to say, you know, they are, this really is important because they will come take all the money back, you know, if you don't do it right, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, those types of things where there is room for what I often suggest to organizations when they, or people, when they run into this is, if an auditor found it, what they would require is a corrective action plan, right? So there's five sure. steps in a corrective action plan. If you're not familiar with what those are, I'd encourage you to go out and check out the MyFed Trainer blog called, let's see, I make sure I get this right, hmm. how to write a corrective action plan. Just Brilliant. That's a very Ooh. sexy title. That, is. Um, that actually is one of our most popular blogs because, yeah. you know, pretty much everybody has to do this at some point in their career. And so what you're identifying is, you know, <laughs> what went wrong, uh, how do we fix it, uh, how do we make sure people are not going to do it wrong in the future, how do we make sure they continue to do it the right way, you know, things yeah. like that. Those are very practical steps. And so what I suggest is when you see something wrong, don't wait for the auditor to find it. Just go ahead and do almost like an internal corrective right, action plan right. that does those same five steps and get it fixed before the auditors come. Yes. So you can go, you know, we realize we didn't have these policies and procedures. We identified that as a problem. We have created a new policy. We have trained our staff. We're monitoring in this way so that everyone stays in compliance. And boy, auditors are just like singing hallelujah <laughs> when they come in and they see something like that yeah. because they know that you're an organization that is building a culture of compliance and it's important to you. Mm -hmm. So if those are the things you've walked into, you are, you are in a situation that is salvageable. What I'm going to tell you about is what we were just talking to Rachel and I were talking about earlier, which is... Um, Again, kind of a grant nerd, and I love these stories to just figure out what went wrong uh, with feeding our future, which is a, you know, I'm from Minnesota. I often tell okay. people that I, you know, they used to have this expression called Minnesota nice, and Although I get still Minnesota do. mad yes. when I see <laughs> these types of frauds. Yes. The, right now, the largest fraud committed during the pandemic was in Minnesota, and it had to do with an organization that got uh, at least $250 million from the Minnesota Department of Education, and they indicted at least 47 people, many of them have already pled guilty. I think there was another 10 that were indicted. And Whoa. what they did is they were a sub -recit. so the money flowed from the federal government to the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. the state of Minnesota flowed it to sub -recipients, and they had one particular sub -recipient, uh, called Feeding Our Future, and uh, right pretty much from the minute they got any money, they started committing a fraud and they had engaged multiple other subrecipients of them because they had the oversight function as the, you know, the main subrecipient to yeah. oversee all their subrecipients. Uh -huh. Well, guess what those people were doing in these sub subrecipient relationships? They were from day one committing us, their folks, their, their activities, which they said were feeding children, were actually falsifying records, creating fake invoices, using Excel spreadsheets to use random number generators to make up imaginary children they were feeding. They were feeding supposedly 5,000 kids a day, and they would use random number generators to, this is what's alleged, and many yeah. people have pled guilty. Uh, to make up ages so that it looked like there was a wide range of ages in, that were being fed. And when uh, the state of Minnesota in their oversight function would push back on this subrecipient to say, you know, we want to see, we're, we're nervous that this really, you really went from zero to 5,000 kids a day and yeah. some of these things just don't look on the up and up. Um, they were told by the director of this uh, sub-recipient that they had their, the state of Minnesota had the relationship with, that um, they were discriminating against them, that they were unfairly scrutinizing oh. their organization. Well, that's one of the things you'll find with fraudsters is they love to be the aggressive people pushing back. So you're like, please, could we see your records? And they're like, you want to see my records? Who do you think you are? You know, don't you know we've been doing this, blah, blah, blah. You know, and so there, there can often be this aggressive posture of fraudsters. Yeah. Um, and so that actually, as an, as an auditor, 
is one of the things that you're trained to look for is what is people's response. It's a red flag when you're starting to get that super aggressive behavior from scrutiny, which is legitimate scrutiny. So my point in that is not just to tell you the horror story, which kind of I got to have my own little mini cocktail party here with there myself. Oh, I see what you fraud. did and I salute you. Yeah. Yes. Is that if you, that's a situation that you've walked into and your first day and this great thing that you think you're going to be helping feed <clears throat> children is to create fictitious invoices, that's not a salvageable situation. No. Yeah, run, and so you not run. only have the situation of how do I get out of this as quickly as possible, but what other ethical responsibilities do I have mm-hmm. when I know that there's something going wrong to take that horrible right. next step where you may be talking to boards, which the boards may or may not be in on it, law enforcement, funding agencies and fortunately the federal government does have whistleblower protections yep. in place yeah. and ways for you to report things like that so yeah. um, hopefully none of you run across that situation in your career but we all know especially when money's flowing fast oh, yes. it happens and it's a very difficult choice for individual to well, deal with i feel like when there's money involved especially that much money involved there is always going to be some person some agency out there that is going to use their powers for evil and take advantage of it. It's just, it's going to happen, sadly. Yeah, and how, I mean, really, how do you get lower than stealing from little children who need food? Food, food, <laughs> yeah. The, so. During the pandemic. During the pandemic, yes. I mean, yes. you it's, can't it's just get worse than that. Yeah. It really is no. mind Well, I'm glad someone oh. did blow that whistle. Yeah. yeah. Somebody did. Yeah, yeah, somebody did. And so, yep. I mean, that's, that's part of the really exciting thing about being a grant professional is you have such potential for good. Mm-hmm. You do. That you can do. I that mean, it's true. it's like, you know, are you uh, are you with the Darth Vader or are you, you know, going <laughs> to let the force be with you for good? Well, personally, thanks to Lucy, uh, Kimberly and I are both Wonder Woman because we, we have our Wonder Woman bracelets. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. As a gift from Lucy. So that's that's the side I fall on. Mm-hmm. They're in my office. Yes. Same. On a shelf where I can see them. Yes. They're all shiny. So I'm glad that we're leaving the dark world of stealing from children during a yes. pandemic. <laughs> moving on, moving, moving on. on. We need to lift ourselves up. Let's, <laughs> put, up. let's put the unicorn Let's take like a deep on, breath, yeah. can we? <sighs> so, so for Rachel, I'd, li- I'd, love, I'd love to segue into maybe things that we could help folks do who are the solo. Before we got really started into our talk today, you were talking about you know, coming or coming to a place like this where you, there are other people who understand what you do because so often you're the only person in your organization who is doing things related to grants, either pre or post award or both. Um, what advice would you give a, I won't say solo practitioner, but solo grant practitioner in their agency? What, what advice would you give them? And I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm also thinking, it's really not a solo kind of thing. And so maybe that's a great place to start. Yeah. And it's interesting because, I mean, I can't tell you how many people came up and just said, I'm the one person, you yep. know, and they were almost kind of hiding, you know, just, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm that person. And it's a lot of responsibility. That's the thing about it is that it's not just that person's really smart. They have the knowledge. It's that it's a lot of responsibility because we're talking about millions of dollars here. A lot of complicated right. requirements right. to be put on the shoulders of one individual. And it's a disservice to the organization because, yes. again, um, as my colleague Becky says, you know, not when somebody gets hit by a bus, when someone wins the lottery and leaves the organization. Yes, I like that better. <laughs> you know, I like it nice. better. It's a positive spin. Again, Way unicorn. to reframe. Yes. I like it. So, so what do you need to do? And I think that the key is I... I talk about this a lot, is building out that culture of compliance. And I think that that is a leadership driven situation because it's what you're trying to do is is codify the various different functions to make a a well-oiled machine within the organization that's able to handle the the grants life cycle from pre through post award. And we know that that's not easy. I'm not saying that, oh, yep, that person's responsible for everything, but it's things like I call it the who, what, when, where, how, when. I think I caught all of them. But it's, you know, the who, what, when, where, yeah, the six of them. So um, so the people, you know, not just having individuals who are in certain roles, but are those the right roles? And right. do they have the knowledge able to function in those roles? And then you have the systems. Now, a lot of people are really interested. There's, you know, grant management systems. There's 
other project management systems, sure. but sometimes it's all just a good old spreadsheet to manage those reporting deadlines. I say, you got to do what works for your organization. That, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, who's tracking, who's managing, mm -hmm. you know, how are those things being organized? And some of those things, I think that that individual could start but again, it's getting that buy-in. And the more you can have things like yes. those job responsibilities, because those are clear. Policies, those are clear, mm -hmm. you know, and processes that are set up and systems. Those things can be infused throughout the organization. Right. And I would say for, if you're starting from scratch, if you're like, I have no idea what the policies are. I don't know where they are. I think they're on like Lou's shelf, but Lou's like working from home now. Yeah. <laughs> and those are dusty. You know, I have no idea where those policies are. Lou. 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 Get on, yourself Lou. together, Lou. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say to start with the terms and conditions of the grant award. So if you're really starting from bare bones, have sure. not sure what you have, start with what is in front of you. That's the low hanging fruit. What do you need to do to manage the award or awards? It'll be very clear. It'll this tell you the, the requirements, you know, which guidance you should be looking at. It'll tell you the reporting deadlines, the systems you should be using, all of those things. So I think it's important to have that reviewed and other people, I'm sure there's other people written into the grant, and so having them read it too and understand. So then it's a shared responsibility. So I think that you start with that mm -hmm. and then you can build out the planning. Okay, now we need to know how we're going to do these particular tasks. And then, okay, wait, I'm a little concerned because we need to do this procurement thing. Then you can work on your procurement policy. Yep. If you don't have travel in there, don't work on your travel policy right away. You know? <laughs> yeah. Is that the part about your hair not actually being on fire? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. That's what I'm saying. Because people get so overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, I need all to do all the these things. policies. <laughs> and I say, no, just start off with the ones that are the most significant, the most relevant to the work that you're doing now, because you can build off of those. So yeah. that would be my advice. That is so cool. And thank you for that, because I've always used the grant proposal itself, whether it's federal or state mm -hmm. or property, as sometimes it can be used as a tool for organizational and program development mm -hmm. pre-award. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for pointing out that it works post-award too. Yeah. If you if there is nothing in place, mm -hmm. you're going with that and you're saying we're starting right here from where we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Very yeah. true. So um, well, I want to take a turn and talk about site visits. <laughs> site <laughs> visits. You're going to visit Lou? We are going to listen Lou. Lou. We're coming to your house, buddy. <laughs> we need that document. <laughs> No, um, when I worked in local government, I went years without ever having a funder show up in my office. I mean, I went a long time. And then suddenly, 2009, we had that lovely American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Or, what could go wrong? Arr, as Danny Blitch likes to call it. The pirate money was coming. Arr. And um, suddenly, I felt like, I think I had three site visits in over the course of a grant project by the Federal Highway Association. So I had three Federal Highway employees three from the, our state department of transportation then me and our construction guy it was overwhelming it was scary it was even though i've been doing it a long time i'm like first of all i've never had a site visit now y'all are coming three times over my grant period and there's a lot of you showing up at my door and i kind of expect it's, it was because so much money was coming so fast that they really were paying attention more so than before I mean, it is kind of a good they should thing, be it is but it was a bad thing but too. it's 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 a good thing but it's still a scary thing. Scary, Even though I'm like, scary. I know I got my ducks in a row, it's still terrifying to have people going through your files and asking you questions and you feel like you're in the principal's office, kind of. I did. Aww. I just, I worried. Um, and it ended up being fine. It, it was fine. We, we kept our money. Everything worked lovely. But I have a feeling people are going to start to see that with the BIL money because, again, it's so much money so right. fast. Mm -hmm. I think people that aren't used to that, you're, it's probably going to happen to you or a friend advice so they don't feel like they're in the principal's office like yeah, i did I that needed, was a loaded question i know i needed a lucy morgan to be like friends, amanda right? it's gonna be okay it's right, not amanda, on fire it's yes be okay yes there, there they are can you okay. pat my head yeah. a little <laughs> and you know the, the the funny part about it is is that it really does come down to that key principle that rachel talked about with yeah. communication because uh i think it's a normal human reaction to 
not want to know and kind of hope it doesn't happen. Yes. Where oftentimes, right. even right. in the proposal, in the NOFO, yes. they're already talking yes. about doing site visits. Yeah. And even if you're a subrecipient, so you're not directly getting money from the federal government, often sure. in the responsibilities yeah. for these pastor entities, they're yeah. also going to be doing site visits. Um, it's, it's, I think people should just expect it, and then when it doesn't happen, they can go, well, well you know, How this nice. was an easy Score. one because they didn't come. <laughs> so what I always suggest to people is, um, and this is an expression, probably saw it on a poster back when we used to have those motivational posters on the wall. It's not which the I think cat that says hang the in cat? there, no, is it? No, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> thank you. This actually is a book titled by Harvey McKay, who founded an, or took over an envelope company. For those of you who are like all digital, you probably don't know what an envelope is, but that is actually a piece of paper they used to fold up and put other pieces of paper in there and put on something called a stamp. So he decided, my life's future is going to be to run an envelope company. But he also wrote a lot of really good motivational books, and it said, dig your well before you're thirsty. Hey, fair. And so build those relationships with yeah. funders before they've arrived on your door to do a site visit. Right. So just ask them some questions like, should we expect a site visit? Uh, what types of things should I have prepared? Don't wait until it's the day they're coming or you get the horrible letter. Build those relationships. You know, if you could send virtual donuts without that being a conflict of interest. Um, <laughs> build those relationships with funders because they want you to succeed. They don't they do. want you to fail. It's not a gotcha moment. They no. really do want you they to succeed. They don't want the money back because they're going to no. deal with they it. They take the money back. Conversation mm -hmm. yes. like that's, you don't win a prize by underspending. They want you to do exactly what you said you'd do, spend all the money. The worst case for a funder is three years later, you go, you know what? We just never got around to that grant. Here's $10 million back. Yeah, that's, that's not a good. feel good moment. No, that is not a feel good moment. No. So build those relationships right from the start and just think of that kind of like eating your vegetables. You know, you do have to do the take that vitamin every day or whatever it is, uh, you know, that, that build those healthy bodies, but also build healthy relationships with your funders or your prime recipient, you know, pass through if you are a sub recipient and just start yeah. asking some questions and have conversations. They're real people on the other side too. Yeah. Everybody wants this to work. Yeah. Um, and so don't dread a site visit. Look at that as a good opportunity to build relationships. She looks visibly relaxed now. I know. Doesn't well, she, I thought I she was nodding off oh there. For like, she's like, oh. Well, and I will say after those, after, after those visits, there's no higher compliment than them going, this is the best organized and managed grant I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, now. I knew what I was doing after all. Mm -hmm. But again, it's still, it's nervous when the feds show up because they're the oh. feds, right? Yeah. It right. Just, but half the time they're just as new to the grant world as you have they the may time. be people yeah. stuck in mediocre hotels eating <laughs> bland vegetables we True. just don't know what True they're story. going through right. they aren't having the lovely food that we've gotten to experience no it's been delicious so thank you both for sharing all your wisdom and your fabulous accessories in fact lucy let me oh right Gotta get the glasses back on. Yes, we have up. decided that the, the rose-colored glasses Lovely. are so needed. So if people can't get enough of this unicorn stuff, <laughs> where is the best place for them to find you both in the wonderful work you do? Well, you can find us at uh, MyFedTrainer.com. MyFedTrainer.com. You can find out all of our trainings yep. and all of the you know upcoming events. We're going to be having an in-person event in Florida in nice. March. We're bringing it back. Oh, I nice. love it. I, I heard there might be a giant unicorn. We event. might be bringing Eunice. I'm just saying, you want more Eunice, then you can come. Come on down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much. You have made what is often a painful topic funny and amusing. See, federal grant federal management. Grant management. Yeah. You got this. You've You've got got this. And if not, you got pretty glasses you can wear. <laughs> <laughs> At least look good while you're doing it. <laughs> Thanks again to today's sponsor, Kim Joyce and Associates. If you want to learn more about career opportunities and client relations with this growing business, visit KimJoyceAndAssociates.com. That's K-I-M-J-O-Y-C-E and Associates.com. Well, and with that, Lucy is officially the most interviewed guest on Fundraising Heyday. This was her fourth time appearing on our show. Um, it's always a treat to have her and such a treat to uh, see her and Rachel both together doing their thing. So we were thrilled to have them on the show. 
I learned something new every time she's on. Absolutely. And Rachel as well was fantastic. And as always, we hope you learned something, but we're also really honored and deeply appreciative that you choose to spend time with us in the podcast. So if you can't get enough of that fundraising heyday stuff, join us in two weeks where we are sharing interviews with a lot of different folks who came there, some some real leaders and some folks who are growing their grants career, who attended the grant summit. We're gonna talk about some really amazing themes and ideas that we think will benefit you wherever you are in your goal fighting or fundraising career. See you then. Bye y'all.